Reverend Dr. Thomas Idikula with us. He's going to bring God's word to us. Let me introduce him. He's the pastor of Boston Christian Assembly. He's also the president of Agape Partners International. He's an instructor in psychiatry in Harvard Medical School, and he's also a certified marriage counselor. He's the chairman of IPC Family Conference 2024, which will be held in Boston, and we thank the Lord for this man of God. He has come here in the past, and he has ministered to us. We are delighted that he's here. He's going to bring forth God's word. Shall we sit in the presence of the Lord with a prayerful attitude? worship service this morning and uh, that will revitalize and reset our mood in the presence of God. I bring, bring greetings in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ to the family of God in this part of the world. I would say this is the third time I'm visiting your place. Exactly over 30 years back I came to this church with my dad. At that time I was not supposed to speak. I was too young. I was a student. My father was scheduled to speak because uh, Pastor K.B. Kurian and Pastor Idikula, my dad, were classmates at the Bible College, Punlur Badel Bible College. I still remember uh, Pastor K.B. Kurian asked me to take a few minutes and minister, but I was not ready. This morning, I am depending on the Holy Spirit. And I am sure that God will minister to our hearts and minds. At the same time, I recognize Pastor Fini Samuel and the whole church for having me here as part of your worship service. Also, my extended family members, Tams and Minnie, I'm not sure they are here, but I recognize them. And also a longtime partner in Sunday School Ministry, Matai Chinangal, over 20 years uh, through the Sunday School Network International Ministry. And a longtime friend and prayer partner, Brother Fini Joshua, also uh, Dr. Jolie Matthew, more recently for the past four or five years with uh, Bevan Angel as part of the um, IPC family conference that will be happening in Boston. And also I'm inviting you for this conf uh, great conference in Boston and as a part of that promotional meeting, we are meeting in this church this evening. And I wish you all be part of this and uh, bless uh, this great conference. For most people, Sunday morning is all about worship and listening to the message. That is our basic understanding. Let me tell you, it is also to tune up your heart to the Holy Spirit so that you can renew your heart and transform your life. Thus, it's not just a listening service. It is not just an offering service. It's a time of renewal. It's a time of transformation so that we will be transformed to his likeness. The next few minutes, I would like to share a message that gives clarity to our life. That is, God spoke to me last week or so. That is, discovering your true identity in Christ. I've been waiting in the presence of God what to share. It's always a challenge because when we have a lot of things in your head, Sometimes it's confused with our spirit event. Thus, we have to, you need more humility. You need to spend more time in the presence of God, what God wants to speak to our hearts. I'd like to read a verse from the Bible taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's amazing. We are created by a loving God. Somehow we are damaged by evil. But Jesus came to this world almost 2,000 years ago. You don't need to continue in this damage. We are restored. We are redeemed this morning. Can we praise God? Therefore, he has put things in place in advance for us. We have to believe it. We need to act on it. Thus, I'd like to share uh, what God's word and how God's word will unlock that full potential so that we can understand our true identity in Christ. 
that will release God's power, God's provisions, God's plan, and perfect, complete, pleasing will in our life. To discover our God-given identity, first and foremost, we need to identify and confirm that we are created by a loving God. That is the foundational thing. Then do what God has called us to do. That need a willful obedience. Sacrifice. One of the most critical issues surrounding Christian today is identity crisis, insecurities in life. If you ask a teenager, father, mother, anyone, there is a form of crisis at the personal level, family level, even at the church level, national level, global level, you can see the reflection of that insecurity. At the same time, God has a clear purpose and identity that is instructed in the Bible. In this world, it is not what we take up, but what we give up makes our true identity. Many times we acquire things for establishing our identity. But when I look and meditate the Bible, it is what we give up. That gives eventually the true identity that is in Christ. Our true identity is based on Christian faith built on the biblical covenant. That is the pledge to love God for the rest of our life. By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and continued by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, which is more important than thousands of hours that we spent in academics, career, sports, all kinds of things. But we have reversed that thing. That's why Jesus said, first seek the kingdom of God and all the things shall be added to your life. Many times the way world operates for establishing the identity is by work. But in Christian life, our identity is established by faith. In the world, to be successful, you need to be wise. But in addition to the wisdom of God, we need the Holy Spirit anointing to establish your true identity. The world operates by law, but we know that Christ operated in our life by grace. That there is a fundamental difference how the world system established its own, its own identity and how God planned in advance for us to establish our God-given identity because our life in this world itself is a preparation for eternity. Therefore, that work is complete as long as you are faithful and obedient. You just follow that plan. Does knowing our identity affect the way we think, way we feel, as well as way we act? In psychology, you can summarize this thing in our, the way head, heart, and hands operate. Head gives the wisdom that gives more kind of an intellectual thing. But our heart gives the emotional aspects, how you feel things. The hands reflect our behavior, our action. Thus, in terms of our identity, definitely you need to know intellectually who are we are in Christ. That's why the Bible study, every day, every week, we learn about the word of God to inform our head precisely who we are in Christ the helmet of our salvation. And also at the heart level, you feel for sure that, that reflection of Christ in our life, no matter what happens to our life. But in the world, the identity means an individual distinguishing character and personality of a person. In our generation, most people are interested in discovering their identity. Anytime when a person comes for help, we just ask, Tell me a little bit about yourself. Introvert, extrovert, mesomert, all kinds of things. But still people are confused about their identity. People seek insight to understand who they are and where they belong and how they relate to the world. That is the conflict. The world has to look us to within to see our identity. But many times we have a tendency to look others to establish our own identity. And some people define their identity through their profession through their status quo, and many other things. And people invest credible amount of time to establish their own identity, but at the end of the day, they are dissatisfied. Because that's not, eventually, you are going to establish your identity. And some people take personality tests. Whether you are a perfectionist, achiever, 
a visionary controller, all kinds of things freely available. Even then people are confused. When I look at globally, the reflection of a poor personality and the lack of confusion that happened at the personal level created global unrest. If you look at some of the people who are controlling the world, the leaders, some of them are insecure. People don't have an identity. It will be reflected in major wars, how they bring confusion to the humanity. That is true when you look around at the national level, the leaders who control, it creates some times laws that is against Christians. That is their worldview. It is reflected in the church leadership too. What you preach, how you prioritize. Is it a true gospel? Whether you are controlled by the spirit of God. The generation gap we experience in a church. And when you come to the family level also, you can see how what is the husband-wife relationship. It is a reflection of your identity. A husband who loves the wife, a wife who respects and works together with the husband, that makes a big difference. Same thing with how you parent your children. Look at the personal level. That will make you either anxious, sad, bad or mad in your life. It all builds on who you are in Christ. At the global level to the personal level, it is affected. Thus, the risk and the benefits when you look at knowing the identity in Christ and acting on it is, is tremendous. In the 60s, when you look at it, the drugs, artificial drugs manufacture a lot of the identity of the young people have been affected. In the 70s, abortion was legalized. Therefore, that also affected how people operated in their personal life. By 80s, you can see that the divorce is also a personal choice for any reason or no reason people can divorce their spouse. That created a lot of identity crisis in family life. By 90s, mental health issues become on the top. Basically, the mental health issues that we're facing is itself is an identity crisis. But people put all kinds of labels. By 2000, we know that the, the media has started controlling the minds and hearts of people, even Christians. More than the word, more than the prayer and the fellowship, even today, media controls the life of people. By 2010, you can see the definition of husband and wife relationship is redefined. By 2020, people don't want to live anymore. Suicide become number one reason for, especially for young people between the age group of 15 to 25, the primary cause of death is nothing but suicide. We lost one million people last year because of an identity crisis. In the United States itself, we lost 50,000 people. More than 10 million people living in this world with a suicidal ideation. They don't want to leave. What we can offer to this generation? Do we have something to give unique to give which the world failed? I believe Jesus offered this package completely as part of his plan and salvation. At the same time, a new deconstruction movement is rising among the Christians in the Western world. I do not know how many of you are familiar with that. The word deconstruction, you can Google it. Deconstruction coined by Blake Chastain refers to unpacking rethinking, questioning one's identity. This led many people dropping their Christian faith, historical faith that is built on the word of God. The Christian worldview has been challenged and threatened. Many are replacing biblical beliefs with cultural popular ideas for attention, status quo and acceptance. It is affecting our community also. The modern deconstruction movement is an increasing threat to the life of many, many people because it is taking people to a downward path affecting their personal life, their family life, marriage, even their eternity. Well, several influential leaders which you may be familiar, they have shared their spiritual struggles publicly in the past Two years. The first one is Marty Samson, a well-known songwriter for Hillsong Worship, announced that he was genuinely losing his faith. He said, Christianity is just another religion. Second, Joshua Harris, author of the bestseller, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, announced his suppression of Christianity, saying, I'm not a Christian anymore. Third person, Dr. Paul Maxwell, former Desiring God, God's writer and preacher, 
said he was no longer a Christian. These are not ordinary people. Extraordinary people, theological degrees, ministered for God for a long time. They are losing their faith. What does that mean? Not to scare you. This alert us. We need to be sensitive to the spirit of God. Amen. It is not by might. It is not by power. It is by the spirit of God. Amen. We somehow thought that with our knowledge and wisdom, we can influence a generation. Not sufficient. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to acknowledge that. According to Blake, he did enough studies. Therefore, I just condense it. So the reason why people are losing the faith, why there is an identity crisis, the first and the foremost one is there is enough social pressure to conform to the progressive social ideologies taught in the school college system and in the media. Second, the desire to sin without guilt because guilt is very painful because once you are guilt free they think they can do what they want third lack of sound biblical teaching and preaching often involving extreme views sometimes leading to false gospel false christianity fourth traumatic and bitter experience in the church people not being treated properly maybe abuse in the church we need to be very careful. This is a holy place. This is the church of God. We are part of the body of Christ. How you relate one another, how you see one another, this is very important. Every word that you speak, every relationship that you have in the body of Christ, because we are seeing a holy God. And finally, there's a perceived satanic influence or demonic assault, which is very invisible, which is also at high alert. Many times when I look at it, all these things are happening in our day-to-day -day life, silencing Christians. What Christians, as we are doing in the workplace and all, we are getting more and more silenced because of what is happening. Indirectly, we are coping up with the system. Because if we talk anything, I'm not saying that tomorrow you go to a workplace and challenge it, but the one who is in, in us is greater than the one who is in the world. You know, you need to believe that. It is not by might, not by actions or our public declaration of things. God can work in all different ways. Thus expressing Christian beliefs or behavior is now becoming problematic for our children. Well, there is no control of inappropriate materials in the media, destroying our minds. There is a choice that we have to make. Thus even if you know the truth, sometimes you are not able to stand for the truth. That is a challenge. For example, some of the changes that I see in the past, you may be, as parents, as well as young adults and children, may be aware about the changes that is happening. For example, adultery, the word changes to open marriages, gender mutilation to gender transitioning, fornication to intimacy, lust to love, spiritual battle of good and evil. If you preach the word of God, it's considered as a hate preach. The language has been changed. Thus we have seen the new, new trend which is happening, but Jesus promised and quoted several 2,000 years ago what eventually things going, how things going to happen. He promised that some would walk away because they did not want to hear this message. Gospel of John chapter 6 verse 65. Again, Paul, St. Paul mentioned, he warned that in the last days people would turn away from sound teaching and have itching ears for false doctrines. It's been warned. Because it's not something new. God knows it. It's going to happen. But what God people must do. There's a crucial shift in today's culture. And Christian families need to understand this identity that we have in Christ. We must cultivate healthy conversations. To communicate love and care. And the Holy Spirit anointing. In the family, parents, or children need to experience how a husband and wife one another, love one another. Same thing within the body of Christ. That is how we reflect and form who we are in Christ. But when young people see poor teaching, traumatic experiences, and negative things, that is going to bring, reflect, bring shame on our faith. 
and what we stand for. The world is broken, but God is trying to put his people together. Till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. When sin becomes bitter, life becomes sweet. I know it's a tough one. That is the standard put by Puritans 300 years back. Still it is relevant. There's no substitute for that. Once Francis Chan said in his speech, nothing in this life ever matter unless it is about loving God and loving the people that God has made. That is true. Even the Old Testament commandments, even the New Testament, God summarized this. It's all about loving God and loving people. But the Pharisees and Sadducees had a major identity conflict to implement and fulfill these Ten Commandments. They completely destroyed its purpose. And Jesus corrected it. It can happen to us also. Thus, we need to be very alert and be aware about to fulfill God's commandments, they will never compromise with our love. It is a warning. Ted Turner, the founder of CNN, the first 24-hour cable news network, once said, he made $10 billion, man of the year for Times Magazine, received star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame, what else you need to accomplish in on somebody's life? And he kept a pet alligator in his home and called Christians are losers. But on his 75th birthday, he said few things that attracted me. Ted wants to go to heaven. He's winding up his life. Second, he had some life questions. He's asking, did I make my mama and daddy proud of my life? Am I loved? Will anybody remember me when I'm gone? Do I get to heaven? At some point in life, you have to answer these questions. Early is best. Thus, first, Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pull down any strongholds. The weapons are given. The tools are given. The word of God. The grace of God. The spirit of God. What else you need? The most powerful weapons are given for us to attack against any enemies. So, but many times there's a conflict with the kingdom of God and the kingdom of devil. How it looks as as negative strongholds, faulty beliefs and lust and pride. And sometimes negative attitude, false beliefs block us from God's plan and purpose in our life. Which will bring into many, many crises. Say so the heart we need to have the correct belief, the true belief built on the word of God, and the heart we need to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Then only you can bring the true intimacy with Christ. It can be, as a counselor, I see many people have identity crisis because of life events which happened in their life. It can be a stressful situation, or it can be demonic oppression. As church of God, as people of God, we need to help some people who themselves cannot come out from it. We can't label them as problems or with a diagnosis. But at the same time, knowing the negative strongholds and tearing down the strongholds, removing some of the legal rights, it's like a car is parked in your parking lot by a stranger. Do you allow it? No. Likewise, there are certain illegal activity happening in people's life by the demonic spirits. Do you feel it? Do you recognize it? We don't talk about those things. That's why the prayer, the casting out and all these things still have a place in the body of Christ. Never underestimate those things. How we can cultivate or establish the identity we need to first believe the lost are found in Christ. And the found are freed in Christ. They experience the true freedom in Christ. And the freed are connected to the body of Christ. They feel they are part of the kingdom. And the connected are commissioned to bring forth this good news. And the cycle continues. 
if the church is not involved in this cyclic process, definitely the identity Christ can come on anybody. Because you are called for certain mission. Many times there is input, but little output. There is lake churches and there is river churches. Lake churches, there is no input and output. But in a river churches, you can see living animals, living fish. It's dynamic. There is flow. In a church that is dynamic, it's like a river church, you experience the flow of the Holy Spirit. People will raise up for missions. And they can challenge people with identity crisis. We are in shortage of such people. We need to pray. We need to nourish and cherish such environment. I would like to give three or four prescriptions for this identity crisis and wrap up here. The first one is the biblical covenant is the foundation for our identity. A biblical covenant is the greatest commitment that you make in your life. A covenant is a pledge to love God unconditionally. He loved us, therefore we are loving him. It's a counter acceptance before the creation of the world he has seen us he has accepted us but believe it or not many people are not able to fully establish that covenant relationship today examine your covenant with God if it's not strong renew it every worship it's an opportunity to renew our covenant with God and this covenant has a relationship with your spouse too if you are married the word, same word has been used. If your husband-wife relationship is not a covenant relationship, I doubt your relationship with God also. That is a reflection in this world, how you connect to God. A husband and wife is not able to be two in one. That may be a rift with the Heavenly Father also. Eventually, it will be reflected in your church, how you are connected to your pastor with your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Be compartmentalized our belief. That creates identity crisis. Never. These are all aligned to one another. Even you can love an outsider. You who disagree with you may have a different lifestyle. Still, you can love because Jesus taught us to love your enemy. Where it comes from? Your worldview, your covenant. This covenant is not a popular word, but you need a covenant love, a pledge to be successful in this world. Well, the second thing that you need is you need to have grace. Grace is the ability to forgive people when they are wrong. First, you need to experience grace by the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, that will give you sufficient grace with one another, starting from your spouse. The, the place where you need more grace is with your spouse, forgiving one another. Then with your children, children with the parents, with the church members, workplace, if you operate in grace, how beautiful that will be. Amen. That's what Jesus did for us. He has completely forgiven us, paid it off before the creation. At the cross, he fulfilled it. If that is true, your identity will be established first by maintaining that covenant relationship. Second, the grace that you are living in forgiveness, not in bitterness. Amen. Number three, you operate in the Holy Spirit. That is the empowerment power of the Holy Spirit. Many times we are thinking about grace, covenant, and we are bragging about what an amazing grace, but when we come to our personal life, we are not gracious. We take it granted grace from God, but we give little grace back to people. Same thing, our God is an empowering God. The Holy Spirit is empowering us every day. Do we empower one another? When somebody is down in their lowest moments, what do you do? There are a lot of people, families going through medical struggles, stress, or misunderstanding. Holy Spirit can use you to empower many, many families. That is something very unique, the teachable moments. 
I believe it. I have seen in many counseling sessions the empowering work of the Holy Spirit, which is more unique as you tune up to the covenant grace and later you experience the teachable moments. Then you will know for sure the true intimacy with God. You experience God in your life. No matter what happens to your life, you experience the power of God, the grace of God, because nothing in the world can distract you. That's why people like Daniel, Joseph had a very little or no identity crisis. Even though they have gone through the worst circumstances in their life, they define their identity by holding to the promises of God, the covenant of God. Even they have been persecuted. They have been betrayed by their own family or others. They are trusted in God because they know for sure who is in control of their life. When I look at Daniel, he decided not to be defiled. That is a covenant relationship. There are enough things in our world to be defiled. That gives you identity, who you are in Christ. At the same time, you are not controlled just by knowledge alone. You are controlled by the spirit of God. That's the secret of Daniel who brought me to the highest level. When nobody can interpret a dream or a lost dream, the Holy Spirit gave him or given him the insight even to bring a forgotten dream back to the king. Finally, no matter what happens, maybe fiery furnace, trusting in God. That gives and holds the promises of God in your life. That is how they become so intimate with God in their life. Such people have a mission, have a purpose. They will establish identity for themselves and for others because their identity is not their career, their education or anything. Jesus. Others can Jesus in their life. This morning, are you empowered in the Holy Spirit? Do you experience his power, his grace? Can you renew the covenant relationship that you already have. I'm sure that this may be a, a different message, you may, but this is what Holy Spirit asked me to share. If you are touched by the Spirit of God, surrender your life, your head, your hearts, your hands, the whole body to the feet of Jesus. That's why Jesus himself, the highest level of grace he offered to his disciples by watching the feet of his disciples. What kind of mentality that we have? Do you determine, do you assess the shortcomings in our life? And acknowledge the Lordship in our, of our Lord Jesus Christ in your life. He can renew the covenant. He can help you to be more gracious. He can empower you every day with his Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you Lord for this wonderful day. Our identity is in you. Our trust is in you. You are a covenant keeping God. You are a gracious God. You are an empowering Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, I pray and bless each and every person who is in this place. Let your power be displayed. Every fear be dispelled in the name of Jesus. I pray for this congregation. Young and the old. Bless them to establish Christ's identity in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.